Okay, thanks for joining us. We are going to lead today into the new unit of evolution. I'm gonna tie it together with genetics, which is the unit we just finished. So we look for similarities between organisms um, based on their genetics, as well as based on their structures. And when we do this, we, we call it uh, phylogenetics and taxonomy. We try to group the organisms together and see who's more similar and who's more different. And we organize it so that we can study their evolutionary relationships. Um, this little tree diagram is called a cladogram, and it's a way of depicting which organisms are more closely related to each other. It's really easy to follow. So basically, if you see organisms that are closer together on the diagram, meaning their branches branch off each other in a more recent time, then you know they're closely related. So of the organisms depicted on this simple cladogram, uh, humans are more closely related to a whale than they are to a type of dinosaur here, Dementrodon here. So you look at the connection where the two lines intersect, and if the connection is closer to the top of the diagram, then you know it's a closer relationship in terms of evolution. Uh, this one is a little bit more specific with humans and some of our closer relatives. So you can see humans here on the right, and our closest rel living relative today are chimpanzees. So all of these organisms at the top of the cladogram are living today. And if you branch down and look for these intersections, this intersection represents an organism that we both evolved from that we call a common ancestor. Uh, and it's not labeled here what our most recent common ancestor would be, but this would be the most recent common ancestor between humans and chimpanzees. And if you go further down the line, this intersection is the most recent common answer between all three gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans. So that's how you interpret these diagrams. Uh, it's called a cladogram. It's just a way of depicting evolutionary relationships. So this concept of studying evolutionary relationships is called phylogenetics. Uh, so we do have genetic basis on how closely related we are to other species. And the, so for example, the beluga whale is more closely related to humans than sharks because we have a more recent common ancestor and you would be able to see that depicted on a cladogram. Uh, so here is a region style question. I know you're not worried about the regions this year, but just thought I'd give it to you for practice. Um, and so it asks you which species is most successful in surviving changes in the environment over time. So if time is depicted here on the left axis, the more recent time is at the top and the past is at the bottom, and the species that's been around since the past and has continued to be present in present time is going to be, out of all these choices, species B, because species B was around in the past and it continued to be able to survive throughout changes over a long period of time. Other species, like for example species D, uh, was unable to evolve and change and make it to present time. And so you see the line kind of ends there. Okay, so that's when a species uh, becomes extinct, when it's no longer present in present time, we call it extinction. I'm sure that's a word you've heard before, uh, but just this is how we depict it in a time cladogram. It's no longer in present time, uh, its line ended in the past. So we try to compare a lot of things to determine relationships between species, their physical structures, how they reproduce, their, what their embryos look like, their behavior, their actual physical symmetry, their cell structure. Uh, but what's most important is their DNA and their RNA protein sequences. Now, you, what you did the last few days in your assigned work was to go through evidences of evolution. So I'm gonna kind of skip through that. Um, but we, that list I just gave you was basically all of the examples of evidence that we have for comparing relationships between species and determining their evolution patterns. Uh, I'm going to do a real quick breeze through how we classify organisms. We call this taxonomy, and you might have learned a fun little saying to help you remember the group of taxa. We probably did this back in middle school. Uh, so Dear King Philip came over from Great Spain is what I learned, and that just stands for the different uh, broad to more specific classifications of an organism. So if, for example, you wanted to classify humans on the right side, it's just another silly saying that I've had students in the past help me come up with. Um, the classification of humans, you could pick D for domain, which domain we are in is eukarya, K for kingdom, we are in the animal kingdom, and you just get more and more specific in these categories as you work your way down the list until you get to species, which is the most specific of the taxa. There are subspecies, for example, like dogs, you have, you know, different breeds of dogs, but they're still all the same species of dog because they can still all breed with each other. Okay, so uh, if it can breed together and make more viable offspring, that means they can also reproduce, then it's the same species. 
we went over these different kingdoms at the very beginning of the year, so I'm not going to really go through the details here. I'm just going to breeze past this, but just reminding you that we recognize similarities and differences between the different kingdoms in terms of their cell structure, eukaryotic versus prokaryotic, uh, their nutrition abilities, are they autotrophic or heterotrophic, as well as their reproductive types, um, and their, whether they're uni unicellular or, or uh, multicellular, uh, and that's how we classify them. We name them in a two naming system we call binomial nomenclature. So what you've probably heard of for humans is Homo sapiens. That Homo represents our genus and that sapiens represents our species. So we give scientific names to species using their genus and their species names from those two taxa groups. Uh, if you wanted to name a fruit fly, it would be in the genus Drosophila, and its species is Melanogaster. So the fruit fly is Drosophila melanogaster. The dolphin is Terciops truncates. So every species on Earth, all eight million-ish or so, have their own specific uh, binomial nomenclature scientific name. And you notice when we write it, we always write it in italics, and we capitalize the genus, and we make the species lowercase. That's just standard formatting for writing down species formal scientific names. Um, we can use a type of tool called a dichotomous key to help us distinguish between species. Uh, this is a dichotomous key. It's just really a series of paired phrase, phrases, so di means two. So it's basically just you follow a set of paired phrases to work through and figure out which species is which based on the characteristics you're observing. So an example of a dichotomous key that's already been created to help you distinguish between these bird species uh, is given here. And so you would just follow the statements in order. So you would just read 1A and it says the beak is relatively long and slender. So if you're trying to figure out bird W, you would say, okay, I'm looking at bird W. This is who I'm examining. Is its beak long and slender? If it is, then it's species Certhidia, but it's not long and slender. So I would look then to the next statement. The beak is relatively stout and heavy. So I would say, yes, it's a pretty big beak. It's stout and heavy. So then the direction says to go to question two or statement two. So then again, you're still looking at bird W and trying to figure out who that is. So statement two says the bottom surface of the lower beak is flat and straight. Um, if that's the case, then your answer is that this bird is Geospiza. But if the bottom surface of the lower beak is curved, then it would not be Geospecia. You'd have to then move on to the next statement, which is statement three. So you just decide which bird you want to identify, who you're looking at, and you work through these statements until you end up getting your answers. So if you wanted to go ahead and try to classify them, these would be what you would end up figuring out them, those birds to be. Uh, so if you had to add in a, an incomplete Dichotomous key, you need to add a statement to help distinguish some species from each other. So for example, these little bees or insects, whatever they are, and you had to distinguish species E from species F, you would see, oh, well, species E is gonna have light colored wings while species F has dark colored wings. So you would make that your focus of the dichotomous key statement number five. You would say, you know, light color is E, uh, dark color wings is F. Okay, so that's a dichotomous key. Now, so that's how we can distinguish organisms from each other based on their traits and their characteristics. Now let's get into the actual theory of evolution, the idea of how organisms have come to be the way that they are in our living world. So evolution is just the process of change over time. And time is usually deep time. We're talking of thousands and millions of years and thousands and millions of generations of a species to see changes in those species over time. So this is not uh, something that happens from, you know, your grandma to your parents. It's, it's going to take a longer time than that. Uh, so some common misconceptions with the idea of evolution is to think that an organism can just like, evolve itself. And that's not the case. When we talk about evolution, we talk about it as a whole species evolving. So this is a little cartoon making fun of that misconception of evolution, saying, Junior, don't evolve into a land roaming creature until half an hour after you've eaten. Mm. Right? So that's kind of making fun of the idea that you're not supposed to go swimming until half an hour after you've eaten, but also making fun of the idea that he's doing the opposite. He's growing legs and walking on land. Uh, and so, of course, organisms don't just choose to do that, and they don't individually themselves do that. We talk about evolution uh, of a species, not an individual organism within its one lifetime. Okay, so evolution takes a long time and it happens within a species. This is another common misconception. If you search evolution on the internet, you're gonna get this picture over and over again. Uh, and this is a misconception of human evolution. This is depicting that we have come from modern day chimpanzees, which is not the case. 
we do have a common ancestor with modern day chimpanzees. We did not come from modern day chimpanzees. Uh, and so there will be something next week that you work through on the details of human evolution, which is fascinating. Uh, you're gonna look through the Smithsonian website um, and you'll learn a little bit more detail. So I just wanted to clarify that misconception. There's a brain pop on it too. It should be accessible from my website if you would like to use it. Now let's talk quickly about evidence because you went through that already the last couple of days. Uh, so some people don't like the idea of evolution. There's, there's other ideas of how organisms have come to be the way they are on Earth, and they are not scientifically based. So we, as scientists, have to look at evidence. Other uh, perspectives can believe different things, but we look at evidence in science. So for it to be a scientific theory, it's got to be based on evidence, which is why the first thing I had you do was look through all the evidences we have for evolution. So I'm going to run through it quick because you already did it the last couple of days. I'm actually going to skip around quite a bit, but this is a list of just some examples of evidence we have of evolution. We have geologic records, the, the Earth's timeline and how long rock layers have been around. We can do carbon dating to determine that. We have fossils. We have remnants of organisms that lived long ago, and we can date them and figure out how old they are thanks to biochemistry. We have the ability to compare things about organisms. We can compare anatomy, which means their structures. We can compare their bones. We can compare their cytology, their cell components. We can compare their embryology. That's an embryo when it's early in development. They, they kind of are hard to tell apart. I'll show you a picture of that. And we can compare finally, and the most important component is their biochemistry. We can compare their DNA and the proteins that they produce and look for similarities and differences. So there's a lot of evidence supporting the idea of evolution. Uh, this picture shows a, a version of the tree of life that obviously does not have every single species, but it does depict the fact that life um, has gone from simple to complex. And that's one of the main ideas of evolution. So evolution states that existing life forms today must have come from earlier life forms because there's you know change over time. And that it tends to show that simple organisms evolved first before more complex organisms. Uh, this is just one of the, the examples of evolution evidence. Uh, if you look at the embryos of these organisms and compare them to each other, they do not show much difference. It's hard to tell them apart. One of these is a human, one of these is a fish, one of these is a frog, one of these is a bird. Can you tell at this early stage of embryology? You can't. It's crazy to see humans had a tail, humans had gill slits in early embryo form. So we share DNA that codes for producing these parts, and yet then we have different regulatory genes that change uh, the use of those parts. And you know, we dissolve away our tail and, and we form our gill slits and eventually form lungs. So later on in development, you can start seeing some differences. And eventually, even further on in development, you can start seeing some differences. So by the bottom picture, you can tell the difference between the turtle and the chick uh, and the human and the fish, but you couldn't early on. So this gives us evidence that we had a common ancestor because in early embryonic development, uh, these organisms all look similar. But the most strongest piece of evidence that we have for understanding that evolution is a strong theory based on evidence is when we compare the biochemistry of organisms. So remember, biochemistry includes molecules, chemi chemicals like DNA and proteins. So if you look at this human strand of DNA and compare it to this chimpanzee strand and compare it to this gorilla strand, and there's a clip in the, uh, the work, the slides that you're running through this week that makes you watch this comparison. You're gonna look for differences between a human and other organisms. And you're gonna end up finding that in these three, the organisms that are closest to each other are the chimp and the gorilla, if you just compare their sequences. But then if you try to figure out who's closest to the human, you're gonna see that there's more differences between the gorilla and the human. That's what I've put a box around right now. The chimp has fewer differences, and therefore, if there's fewer differences, the chimp is going to be more similar to the human in the sense that it produces uh, very similar DNA sequences. So the most effective method of determining evolutionary relationships, the most effective evidence, is to compare the biochemistry of these organisms, compare their DNA sequences, compare their proteins that they produce. Um, because if you only rely on physical characteristics, you might uh, have unseen molecular differences and not be able to, to tell. So we do rely mostly on molecular evidence now that we do have that technology. All right, so let's talk about some of the theories of evolution. So there's a few different players who kind of tried to work this out and make sense out of why organisms are the way they are. Uh, the key guy is Darwin. 
So I'm gonna build up to Darwin and get in a lot more detail about Darwin after I first introduce you to some of these other theories. And there are others besides these as well. Um, this is just a few. So if you think about how you get your characteristics, you're gonna realize, and this goes for other animals too and other organisms too, you inherit some characteristics genetically, but then you can acquire some characteristics. So if we were in class together, this is the day that I find fun and I bring out my hula hoop and I hula hoop for you guys and I've in the past hula hooped the entire period. Uh, just to demonstrate that hula hooping is an acquired characteristic. I learned it, I developed it with practice. Um, inherited characteristics are things like my eye color, my skin color, my height. Uh, I'm sure you can tell the difference between your inherited and your acquired characteristics. Uh, so what we're gonna get into now is the idea that was introduced by someone named Jean Lamarck and Lamarck's theory of evolution had some basis in understanding inherited versus acquired characteristics. So this is a beautiful ballerina, ballet dancer, uh, showing off her strong leg muscles that she's developed over her many years of, of practicing ballet. The theory that Lamarck produced is gonna have some items that are right and make sense and still persist today, but Lamarck's theory also is gonna have some components that we know are wrong. Now, he proposed one component of his theory is the idea of use and disuse. If you use it, you build it. If you don't use it, you don't build it. So think about the size of a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets, like this ballet dancer's muscles. Okay? So that's, that's a theory that persists today and it doesn't make sense. Another component of Lamarck's idea was that he thought, and this is where we're gonna hit a big wrong, he thought that individual organisms, like an individual giraffe, could develop a structure because it needed to. This is one of the most common misconceptions with understanding evolution. Uh, I had a conversation with my husband just a few years ago about the ideas, and he still had this misconception in his mind that organisms changed because they needed to. This is not correct. Uh, he's not a science teacher, by the way, FYI, not, not to throw him under the bus. It's a common misconception. Um, so organisms cannot change just simply because they need them. So Lamarck said, Oh, a giraffe needed to reach food, so it stretched its neck. And then eventually all the giraffes had stretched necks because the first one stretched its neck, uh, which is incorrect. So this part of his theory is wrong. Um, so he just kept saying, oh, they were short giraffes at first, but then food on the ground got scarce and they had to reach and stretch their root to get higher leaves on the tree. So they just kept on stretching and stretching until, and then they would pass their stretched neck to their offspring. And then that would allow the next generation to be taller and taller and taller. Um, so it's not based on need. We know now why you get your traits and it's based on genes and sometimes mutated change genes. Uh, so he said that you could acquire a characteristic and then pass it on to your offspring, which we know is not the case, okay? Now, little side note, dipping back into our genetics, we do now know that there are things that can be passed on to the next generation without actually affecting DNA. And this is a concept called epigenetics. We have chemical tags on our DNA that cause it to tightly wind up and not be expressed or loosen up and be expressed. And these things we are finding can be passed down from generation to generation. There's uh, chemical molecules, methyl and acetyl molecules that do this to our DNA and tighten it up or un unwind it. Uh, and that can be passed on from generation to generation. So. From that idea, Lamarck was not completely wrong, but Lamarck wasn't talking about that because he knew nothing about epigenetics or DNA and genes. So this guy, this next guy, Weissman, was like, hey, Lamarck, you're wrong. You can't inherit an acquired characteristic. Watch how easy this is to disprove. I'm gonna cut some tails off of mice. I know it's mean, right? Look at that cute little mouse with its missing tail. Um, I'm gonna meet mice that have no tails. If Lamarck's right, then the babies should have no tails. But guess what happened? The babies had tails. All right, so Lamarck's theory was disproven with a pretty simple chopping the tails off of mice example. Now, the person who did get it right and we're most gonna focus on in understanding ideas of evolution is a man named Charles Darwin and his theory of natural selection. Big important emphasis on natural selection. We previously talked about artificial selection where humans were selecting and choosing who would breed. Um, Darwin's idea is that in nature, in the environment, when there's no interference, it's nature or the environment that determines who's gonna survive and therefore live to reproduce. That's the whole basis of his theory. Nature determines who can survive there and therefore who will reproduce and pass on their traits. That's it, that's the big takeaway of evolution. So he says environments determine traits, 
uh, whoever's most fit, which really means suited, not strong or healthy or big, it means suited. Whoever's most suited for the environment will survive. That's called survival of the fittest. Uh, and he said that if you have traits or what we call adaptations, it's a characteristic that you have, if you have a trait that helps you survive, you're more likely to reproduce and make more of those organisms that have that same trait. So we're gonna see favorable traits increase in a population. And he made all these observations on a long journey around the world, five years of study, documenting organisms of every, one specific place he um, did a lot of research was the Galapagos Islands, which is a small chain of islands off the coast of South America. And one of the major organisms he studied there, he studied many organisms, was uh, a bird species called finches. And he ended up seeing different species of finch with different beak structures uh, that allowed them to survive on the different islands based on what food type was on that island. Were the food types big seeds or small seeds? Were they bugs? Were they, you know, different food types allowed different birds with different beak types to develop there. That was one of his main findings. Um, so that's how he came up with these ideas. He came up with the idea of fitness. So if you wanted to say who's best fit or which environment is this polar bear going to be a best fit for, it's kind of obvious. The polar bear is white and it's really furry. It's going to be more able to survive in the cold, snowy region than in the uh, forest region. Okay? It's going to be able to blend in. It's going to be able to hunt more effectively. Uh, it's going to be able to keep warm. So the traits that polar bear has are most fit for a snowy environment. If we put polar bears in a forest, they're not going to be as fit to survive. They're, they might not even survive to reproduce. And we might see them go extinct if they all had to change their environment. I'm um, gonna skip through the cartoons just to be a little quicker. So a little more detail on Darwin's theory. Okay, we're gonna go through some key components, like six main ideas of this natural selection theory. Uh, so here's a picture of the, the map that he traveled around the world. These are the Galapagos Islands, and he found a lot of variety and a lot of uh, unique species here on each island, unique from the other islands, as well as unique from the mainland. So he realized that, and ended up determining these relationships um, and these differences were due to many, many years of isolation and uh, being reproductively isolated and eventually different species form. Some really cool organisms you can see on the Galapagos Islands are these giant Galapagos tortoises, uh, these really cool marine iguanas, so fascinating kinds of birds, more fascinating birds. I love the way that guy's looking at you. Fascinating birds. Um, and finches, uh, not as fascinating maybe to look at, but really unique in their different beak types. This finch has a really short stout beak, but others have uh, more bigger beaks or narrower beaks, depending on what type of food that they eat and where they live and where that food is. So Darwin's main ideas of natural selection, this is really important. This is the like basis of understanding evolution. He said six main ideas. Number one, overproduction happens. That means it's normal in nature, organisms are gonna die. So what happens is organisms make more offspring than, than can possibly survive. This is gonna help ensure at least someone survives. Uh, competition's gotta happen. Since there's more organisms than can sur survive, there has to be competition. What do organisms compete for? These lions are probably competing for a mate or a territory. Organisms also have to compete for food or for other limited resources because they're all struggling to exist and struggling to survive. So overproduction, number one, competition, number two. In a species, we're going to see variation. Okay? Variation is actually a really important key to survival of a species. The more different variations and different types of adaptations organisms have, the higher likelihood that at least some of them can survive in an environment that might change. So differences in traits among individual species are just what we call variations, and Darwin observed many variations. He said that the most fit for an environment will survive. Again, that does not mean strong. That means who's best suited for an environment. They're the ones who are going to survive, they're going to be the ones who reproduce, and therefore their traits or adaptations will be the ones you see more in the population. Because any organism that has an unfavorable trait that does not help it survive, it's going to die and you're not going to see those traits reproduce. A um, little backstory for this example, you got to have some perspective uh, before I give you this example. So this is a tree, you're looking at the bark of a tree, the brown area, and then that thing in the middle, that kind of like leafy looking thing is an organism called a lichen. Lichens are a symbiotic combination of algae and fungus that live together uh, and they grow on tree bark. 
So this is a lichen. Uh, the reason I'm telling you this is because of this example of peppered moth evolution in Great Britain. So it, this concept is gonna happen around the Industrial Revolution. So back around the Industrial Revolution, before it happened, the trees around cities were covered in lichens. And so in that sense, the lichens made the trees appear very light in color because the lichens were like almost a whitish color. Now, if the trees are a whitish color and these two moths are both sitting on the tree, the lighter colored moth on the right is gonna blend in a little bit better on the light colored tree. This black moth, the dark colored moth, is sticking out like a sore thumb against this light colored tree. So if a predator, like a bird, is flying by looking for lunch, the predator is more likely gonna spot that dark colored moth. So it was actually really difficult to see and find dark colored moths, uh, peppered moths in the population because they were more rare. Vari variations still existed, but they were more likely to die and not survive to reproduce. Um, but after the Industrial Revolution, uh, the pollution actually killed the lichens on the trees. So the trees changed color in the sense that the lichens died, and so the bark was dark color now, the normal bark color. So what happened then? The environment changed. The light colored moth, down here in the bottom, I don't know if you can even see it, the light colored moth sticks out like a sore thumb on this new environment, and the dark colored moth blends in. So this is an example of how the moths didn't change individually, the environment changed. When the environment changes, a trait that you have that used to be helpful, like being light colored, now is bad and it's not helpful. So now the light colored moth is more likely to get pecked by a bird and eaten, and the dark colored moth is gonna camouflage and blend in and be more likely to survive. So we saw population changes in the population of moths, more dark colored moths survived after the Industrial Revolution because they blended in better with this new environment. So it's important to realize an individual moth cannot change its color. It does not change its color but it can die because its color didn't help it survive. And then you're more likely to see the colored moths that were able to survive in that given environment. Environment determines who survives. All right, so which moth is best fit depends on the environment. In the original environment, the light moth was best fit. In the new environment, the dark moth was best fit. So that's the English peppered moth, an example of survival of the fittest given a changing environment. Now that the next concept Darwin said is the idea of reproduction. So if you're best fit to survive, you're more likely to survive because you have the traits that are good for that environment. So you're more likely to reproduce. And when you reproduce, you're more likely to pass on those traits. And so we see those favorable traits appear over and over again in future generations. So if you survive, you pass on your favorable traits. If you don't survive, you don't pass on your traits because they were unfavorable. Another idea, he noticed there was geographic isolation. Those islands were separated from each other. You could be geographically isolated um, by a river, a mountain range, changes in the land masses. Uh, and so organisms that were previously within the same species, if they ended up isolated from each other, they actually could be physically separated for so long that changes within these separated populations happen differently and you can end up having a completely new species and be separate species from each other. Again, we're talking about over a deep time here, a long time for speciation to take place. So he recognized and realized that geographic isolation leads to what we call reproductive isolation. If you're physically separated from organisms that you used to reproduce with, then you can't reproduce with them anymore. And if you're reproductively isolated, then just over the many generations of many years of separation, random changes in DNA can occur and you could end up producing DNA that's so different from one another that you end up being so different that you can no longer interbreed. And that's why we have speciation, new species forming from previously uh, founder or common ancestor species. So speciation is over time, long periods of time mistakes. Different variations can cause populations to diverge. Diverge means to separate from each other and become different, and they could become their own species. So that's the last of Darwin's main ideas. So he had overproduction. He had um, uh, competition. He had the idea of survival of the fittest. He had the idea of reproduction. He had the idea of speciation. 
Uh, and so this is how he explained the Galapagos finches that he observed and all of their differences. And this is, you, you won't have to memorize any of these finches, uh, but you could be provided a diagram like this one and you might be asked to interpret who's more similar uh, and who's different and who's more likely to compete with each other because of those similarities or differences. So if you are gonna be uh, an insect eating finch, you're probably not gonna compete with a finch that eats seeds, vegetarian tree finch, okay? So populations that don't compete for the same food can live together in the same area if they're not competing for it. Um, if you end up having to compete for food, then it's possible that one species either will have to move and leave and migrate somewhere else. If you're a bird, you could fly to another place. Uh, or they could, they could die out. Both are potential solutions to that competition problem. So one last way to explain natural selection's main ideas, if you take those giraffes that Lamarck tried to say, hey, they just stretched their necks and then passed on the stretched neck. No, that's not what happened. Darwin's idea makes a whole lot more sense when you think about how come giraffes have long necks now. So Darwin would say that back in the day, gi giraffes must have had a lot of offspring. That's the idea of overproduction. Um, and there must have been a lot of variation. There were some short neck giraffes, some long neck giraffes, some medium neck giraffes. And at some point in time, they could all survive because there was plentiful food. Uh, but eventually there's going to be competition for limited resources. If the environment changes and makes food limited and there's not enough uh, low-lying leaves to eat, then the short neck giraffes are going to die. So the long necks might survive because they can reach food high up and food that's low on the ground. Uh, so eventually over enough time, as long neck giraffes survive and reproduce, short neck giraffes die and don't reproduce, we end up seeing that the long necks are most fit to survive and therefore they are gonna be the ones that end up reproducing and passing their traits on to future generations. And so the long neck giraffes are what we see alive today. Now, we've gotta take a little twist to this because Darwin was right on, he made, everything makes sense, it all applies, uh, but he didn't understand the basis of variation. What we now know today, thanks to genetic technology and research, we know that there are genes and there's DNA and the genes code for traits. He didn't know what coded for traits because this he was around back in the 1800s. Um, so now we've taken his theory of evolution, which was natural selection, we put a modern twist on it to understand and apply it with a genetic component. Uh, so he didn't know about mutations, so that's what we have to add in our modern evolutionary theory. I love showing this guy's picture because he's got an extra finger on each hand, um, and that is obviously caused by a mutation. And in certain environments, a mutation is bad. But in certain environments, a mutation could be good. It could be helpful. It depends on the environment. If this guy's only way to make money was going to be to be uh, a mitten model, then he would probably not survive. If he was able to play piano though and earn his living from playing piano, he might actually have an advantage because he's got extra fingers to reach extra keys. This is a, a, you know, an elaborate example. Um, humans are not constrained by their environment as much as other organisms. So uh, human evolution uh, today doesn't really apply the same way as it does in the natural world. But Darwin didn't know about mutations. He also did not know about the origin of life itself. So those are some weaknesses in his theory, and that's what we attempt to add on to our modern theory of evolution. I'm going to go really fast through this one because the origin of life is still not really fully understood. We have some hypotheses about how life might have started on Earth, but there's always new research that says, nope, it probably wasn't like that, and they contradict each other. So we really don't know for sure how life started on Earth. So we can't fully explain that with too much evidence. Uh, but we do know for sure that mutations lead to change in organisms. We see mutations lead to variety in organisms. We know that they happen randomly and spontaneously. We can't stop a mutation from randomly happening if DNA changes because there's a mistake in transcription or a mistake in replication, it just happens. But they provide genetic variation in a species. So some humans have blue eyes, some humans have brown eyes. If you go back far enough in time of when our human ancestors were originally starting to roam the earth, they didn't all have that much variation. Variations arise because of mutation. Favorable traits, meaning they help you survive, get passed on and you're gonna see them increase in frequency. Unfavorable traits are gonna decrease in frequency because they don't help you survive to reproduce. They might not be completely eliminated, but they're gonna decrease in frequency. Uh, lastly, to remember the environment changes, and so if it changes, the trait that was once not useful could end up becoming useful, like those peppered moths. Okay, it used to be if you were a black moth, it was not good, but in the new environment, being a black moth was a good thing. So the environment determines that factor. 
mutations are going to be what increases the chance of evolution because you're getting more variety in the species. So it's a higher likelihood that at least some of them can survive a changing environment. Here's who's more likely versus least likely to evolve. If a species is reproducing sexually, it's more likely to evolve than a species that's reproducing asexually. Um, if a species has more variation, more mutation, reproducing sexually does allow and add to that, uh, they're more likely to evolve. And then also, if a species is reproducing asexually, it's less likely to evolve. We have different time frames for evolution. I'm going to go through this real quick. Uh, so we have some examples of evolution happening very slowly and minor changes over time. That's a concept we call gradualism. And then we have some evidence like when the dinosaurs all got wiped out within a short period of time because um, an asteroid hit the Earth. That we call this punctuated equilibrium. So there was some periods of stability and then boom, big amounts of change after stability. Uh, and we have examples of both. Both are accurate depictions of mechanisms of evolution. Uh, now, how have humans been influencing the idea of natural selection? This is one really cool example I saw an article about, well, not such a cool thing. Um, poaching is a problem in Africa. That's when hunters kill organisms, mainly elephants here in this example, just for their tusks. And this is, an, and this is called poaching. It's illegal, you're not supposed to do it, but they're doing it anyway because they can make money from selling the tusks and, and getting uh, money for the ivory usage. So what we've seen happen in populations of elephant species is it's actually more favorable to not have tusks. So the elephants that don't have tusks because they have a whatever genetic trait to not make tusks, they survive more than the elephants with tusks because poachers aren't hunting them. And so we see them survive and we see them reproduce. And so the population is actually shifting to have more organisms with no tusks than to have elephants with tusks. Because having a tusk became a survival disadvantage because you're more likely to get taken out by poachers. It's incredible how humans are having an impact on natural selection. Um, so to expand on that idea of who's more likely to evolve and who's less likely to, to evolve, we also have to consider reproductive rates. If an organism has a fast reproductive rate, meaning short generation cycles, like insects or bacteria, they're gonna have a faster evolution rate because there's just more changes, more generations repeating those changes. Um, if there's a slower reproductive rate, we're gonna see slower levels of evolution. And so this leads us into explaining why from an evolutionary perspective, we have a problem of resistance developing to certain chemicals we use. Uh, this is an example of resistance in pesticide usage. So pesticides, a chemical like Roundup, we spray it on our crops because we want to kill the bugs that are ruining our crops. It's called the pesticide. It's meant to kill pests. Um, some bugs are becoming resistant to our pesticides. They're getting a random mutation that's letting them be resistant and letting them survive our pesticide usage. So resistance is becoming a favorable trait and therefore they're passing it on and we're seeing more and more pests have resistance to our pesticides. This is a problem. It's like a spiral effect of just, we have to then make a stronger pesticide. And then that pesticide eventually might get, you know, resisted by the bugs eventually too. And then we have to make another stronger pesticide. So this is like a spinning wheel, it's spinning out of control and we're kind of just behind the problem. This is also happening with bacteria that are becoming resistant to our yeah, to our antibiotic medication. Um, we are increasing pesticide resistance and increasing antibiotic resistance by simply using them more. The more we use them, the more that we're actually using them to kill organisms that are not resistant. But guess what? If an organism is resistant, it survives, it reproduces, and you're gonna end up seeing more of those resistant organisms. That's the idea of natural selection. We're changing the environment. We're adding these drugs and we're adding these pesticides to our, the environment in a way to try to help ourselves, but we're also really helping anyone that happens to be resistant survive. We're making them have an advantage, which is gonna ruin our usage of these chemicals. So overusing pesticides and overusing antibiotics can actually lead to them eventually failing to work because populations become resistant. It's the, just a natural process of evolution and they pass that resistance on. Eventually we have fully resistant populations of these bacteria and of these bugs. Crazy scary things. Bacteria also, I know I told you that they're reproducing asexually, so you would be like, oh, well, if they reproduce asexually, there's less variation. Well, side note, bacteria can actually exchange genetic information with each other. 
Um, and if, if they do that, then they're going to pass on that resistance a lot more quickly than if we only saw them reproducing asexually. So here's a little depiction. If we have the little red bacteria be the resistant ones, but they're living in a colony of the yellow non-resistant ones, we squirt them with antibiotics, we're going to only kill the non-resistant yellow ones. And now what we're doing is leaving very little competition for those resistant ones, and they're going to be more likely to survive and reproduce, and they're going to increase in number. We're going to see more and more and more resistant bacteria as we use our antibiotics. Key thing to realize, the antibiotic does not trigger resistance. No, resistance happens naturally by random mutation. Those bacteria that are resistant just got lucky, they got a random mutation, and then the antibiotic doesn't work on them. So they're more likely to survive and reproduce in an environment where we're using antibiotics because we're killing all their competition. They become, uh, they, they become more able to survive, and therefore we're going to see more resistant bacteria in that population. This picture is showing pretty much the same exact idea. Uh, a resistant variety is all by itself at first. It's got more competition when there's no drugs being used against them. But when we go ahead and use the antibiotics and we kill off most of the competition, now survival is a lot easier on the resistant one. And we're gonna see more and more resistant bacteria as we use these drugs. This is actually pictures of bacteria growing on a Petri dish. We call it an agar plate. The little white dots represent pieces of paper that are soaked in different antibiotics. The antibiotics are useful if you see a wide, clear area around them. This is called the zone of elongation. This means the antibiotic is effectively killing all the bacteria within this zone around the white disc. What you see down here on the bottom plate is that there are no zones around any of these white discs. This bacteria species growing here is completely resistant to all four of these different antibiotics being uh, demonstrated here on the disc. That's a problem in fighting infections. So we have to keep coming up with new antibiotics to try to fight off resistant bacteria. And we've got to save them and keep them in our arsenal and not overuse them unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, so the reason you see different zones of inhibition here in this plate is because these bacteria are resistant to some of these antibiotics. Like this one, they're pretty resistant to it. They grow right up to the disc. Okay? But they're not resistant to this antibiotic. So this antibiotic must be a stronger antibiotic that is um, able to kill these bacteria more effectively than this antibiotic. So you can't just take random antibiotics for an infection. You need your doctor to, to prescribe the right antibiotic for your infection for it to properly kill and treat that infection, depending on what that species bacteria is. Um, so the rest of it I'm going to go into, it, it's just talking about different uh, ways you can help reduce this, this problem. We can't permanently fix the problem, but how we can slow resistance is by just not overusing antibiotics. We can just don't take them too often. Practice good hygiene and try not to get sick. Use your natural immunity. Um, then if you need to take antibiotics, you've got to use them as prescribed. So you don't take antibiotics for viruses because they don't actually help. You're just wasting antibiotic usage. Um, so You've got to finish the full prescription of antibiotics, even if you feel better sooner. That's going to help ensure that just in case any bacteria didn't die, uh, even though you're feeling better, they could still be there. You've got to follow and finish the prescription to ensure that you've completely eradicated the infection. You can also just stop using antibacterial products and just use regular soap. Soap washes away germs off of your hands. Uh, meanwhile, antibacterial products are meant to kill the bacteria. But if you read them, they say they're 99.9% .9 effective. No one's ever going to say they're 100% effective. Why? Mutation. We cannot account for random mutation, and so no product can claim with 100% effectiveness that it's going to be able to kill every single uh, possible pathogen. So regular soap will do just fine more effectively than antibiotic uh, bacteria, antibacterial soap in the long run. You can also help by eating food that is um, produced by organisms that are not given antibiotics in their feed. Again, this is just limiting the overuse of antibiotics. We want to try to reduce our use and not overuse the antibiotics that we currently have working because that'll only give more opportunity for resistance who happen to be out there to survive and reproduce. End of story. I know that was a lot of information to take in. Hopefully you will uh, be able to go back and rewatch it if you need any help, but I think the work that you're doing this week going through the slides is going to be very helpful as well. I'm going to just come back here and I'm going to end the recording. Thank you for watching.